Hello, everybody, and welcome to Getting APIs to Work. Today, we say hello to Eberhard Wolf, who's a fellow at InnoQ. Hello, Eberhard. How are you doing? Uh, great. Glad to be on the show. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for joining. I, I invited you because just a couple of weeks ago, you posted a video on YouTube and, and Twitter, I think, um, talking about Kafka and some, let's say, of the pitfalls around Kafka. And I. I found that very interesting because there still is kind of a lot of momentum around Kafka. A lot of organizations are looking into it. And you pointed out that there are some, let's say, risks involved when you start using it as a database or as a centralized component that, that has a lot of like centralized model data. Can you give us a brief executive summary of, of the video that you produced? Because I think the point that you made is really, really interesting. Yeah, um, of course. So first of all, I would like to say that Kafka is actually a great technology. So I enjoyed it a lot. And I think that the whole approach that Kafka has with is, is rather, let's say, a simple technology that, that is guaranteed to scale, is easy to understand, and also I think works quite, quite great. So that's not the problem that I have uh, with, with it. It's rather around uh, software architecture. And I have a microservices background. So I would argue that what you want to do is you want to have small components with independent database schemas, independent data models. And the reason for that is that you want to have loose coupling. And because of encapsulation, so it's actually even a modularization thing, nobody should look into the data structures that a, mono, that a microservice, for example, has. So the database should be hidden. So that's basically where I'm coming from. And now if you use Kafka, um, there are the first thing that you might want to do is you might want to say, okay, here is an event such as here is in your order. And one microservice could, for example, issue an invoice. Another one could start the delivery process and so on and so on. And if you do that, then you do have a dependency, um, a point in the architecture that almost every microservice will depend on, or at least a lot of microservices will depend on. And I think that's somewhat bad because it means that this data structure is hard to change. And um, however, it might be a good solution. I'm not arguing, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be used at all. I'm just saying that if you have this one data structure, a lot of services will depend on it. And the other problem is there is event sourcing or the way that event sourcing is sometimes interpreted is that you use these events that are stored in Kafka and you use them to recreate the state of your microservices like invoicing or uh, the delivery process microservice. So you can throw away all of the state and you can recreate it from the events. And if you do that, and I think that is something that a lot of people don't realize, if you do that, then your local database is just a cache of the global state that is in Kafka. So we do have one global state, one global schema. It's not in a database anymore, but it is in Kafka. And that is the one schema to, that all the microservices use because their own state is just a cache. And that basically brings us back to uh, the original point. So we want to have small database models, small database schemas, independent database schemas. And this is something that you just threw out of the window because you're using Kafka in this way. So that is the problem that I have with this approach. So drilling down a little bit on the first point that you made. So you said that, you know, if you have an invoice service or no, if you have an order service, I think that was your starting point, right? That basically said that, that a new order came in. Um, but then wouldn't like a normal design be that you have, let's say an order API, regardless of whether it's Kafka or anything else. And that, that API will have some data model, right? And that data model is, probably something that everybody depends on because that's what you think, well, this is what an order looks like. In that case, I'm wondering, like, where do you see the specific problem happening there, maybe in the, in the Kafka case? 
It's an architecture decision and the architecture decision that uh, you just proposed is that we do have this one data model that everyone uses and you're right this could be uh, implemented as um, messages that are stored in Kafka or it could be implemented as a REST API or whatever. So that's that's not the point. The point is that we agreed that there is this one data structure. Now if you look at it um, this might not be there are alternatives and the alternative is to have one data structure that is used by the invoicing process and another data structure that is used by the delivery process and this might make sense because they might be interested in different information so for example uh, the delivery address is something that the delivery process would be interested in but it's hardly imaginable that the invoicing process would be interested while the invoicing process is very interested in the invoicing address which the delivery process probably doesn't is not interested in. So you could split apart this huge model and you could have two different models and those would be shared just between two services so they are easier to change because there are just two parties involved in this interface negotiation as opposed to this global data structure where everyone is uh, is involved in, in the discussion. So I, And I think the reason why I made this video is because I think there is a tendency to go for this global data structure and that might be right but I think it's important to make clear that there is a trade-off and that you are on one side of the trade-off and that you do have alternatives. I'm not saying you should use those alternatives, I'm just saying there are alternatives, think about them and think about which alternative you're choosing. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I always see I mean, there's kind of a, I would say, like an inherent tension on the one hand, right? If you design APIs, I think in many cases, people would say design them for reuse. That's the idea of an API is that it's reusable, right? So that if somebody wants to use it, they can just use it. They don't have to do like initial setup and like an integration process, right? So, so I think that's kind of one of the typical advantages that people are saying APIs have. On the other hand, there's always this problem of, well, how much in advance can I plan for this reuse, right? Do I know all the possible scenarios where reuse might be possible? And I think finding that balance, that's one of the typical and hard struggles in APIs. Yeah, and I have to admit that that I'm coming from a sort of different perspective. So what I, I keep thinking about is, is domain-driven design. And in domain-driven design, there are patterns like open host service where you say, okay, here is a generic API. And there are other patterns like customer supplier where one team is actually sort of providing a service for another team. And those are different types of interactions. So customer supplier is more like two parties involved. Uh, so one party is the customer for the other party who is the supplier. And then there is the open host service where you would have many teams that consume the provided services. And um, open host service is obviously, as, as you said, all about sort of reuse. And it actually says that whoever provides the open host service should have the last word in, in what is part of the API. While customer supplier is probably different and even in open host service, there is the sort of escape to say, you are, you are very special, you have very special requirements, so you get that specific API for you. And I think that's, that's what, I didn't mention it in the, in the video, but that is sort of the, the thinking behind it and, and uh, the, the reason why, why I, I'm thinking along those terms as, as I uh, have put them in, in the video. And, and the part that I found particularly interesting was that, that you said that at some point, right, you basically turn that, that Kafka into your centralized database, so to speak. Right. And, and I think that is something that you definitely see quite a bit, where Kafka becomes this, basically, I always say just basically to, to make people angry, right, as, as it's just your new ESP. It's just a centralized component where you're thinking that this solves all my problems. And I think we've all seen like some of the disadvantages of this pattern. Do you think that that is a completely ridiculous point to say that in that used in that way, you actually kind of replicate the ESP pattern or is that something that makes sense for you? Um, as I said, I think it's, it's a trade-off and you have to decide what, what you want to do. 
um, and I'm I'm all in for you know an architect who tells me this is why I've chosen to have that one data structure and that's it. I think there are some things that are sort of uh, let's say I I don't really understand why you would want to recreate the state of a microservice from such global events. So I would have uh, a discussion about about that why you would want to do that because I think that's very hard to accomplish and I'm not sure what what the benefits are. So that is something that that I th uh, think is interesting. And let me just add one thing because I found that very funny. Um, so yesterday I, I was talking, actually talking about this pattern in, in a workshop at a conference and there was, um, there was one attendee um, and she said, is this even a realistic pattern? So, and I, I found that interesting because it's such an opposite view of, of, you know, at one point you get used to this idea that we are talking about event sourcing, this misunderstood application of event sourcing and this, this global story in, in Kafka. But it seems that for some people, some people are even wondering whether it's a realistic uh, architecture. And I found that, that quite interesting. Event sourcing? Yeah, I, I think it is, it is quite a radical idea in, in my view. It's like some people really, really like it. And like, there's quite a number of people who say, yeah, I, I, I can't even see how this would work. So I, I think it is kind of a divisive idea a little bit. Yes, I, I've had the same experience. Yeah, I would even argue that it's, it's applied in the wrong way. So uh, if you are, so, so um, there, there is a very good article by Martin Fowler about uh, event sourcing. It's actually somewhat old, so, so f it was done quite some time before the, before the hype. And what he basically says is event sourcing basically just means that you store the state optionally and the events that led to the state. So if you have an account, for example, a banking account, then you have all uh, the bookings on the account and then you have the balance. And as soon as you store, in addition to the balance, also the bookings, then this is event sourcing. So going back to our example, I could easily imagine that you use event sourcing uh, to store the state of an order because that might be, you know, you might add something and something and then you, you, you cancel the, the order and it's canceled and these kinds of things. So there are a few events and then you, you calculate the state of, of that. For an invoice, I think it's almost ridiculous because in bookkeeping, you know, an invoice is something that must not change. It is there. And if you have uh, if you have a problem with the invoice, you do something different. You, you do some compensation or whatever. So what I'm trying to say is event sourcing to me is about modeling the state of, for example, an order. And that should be a decision that is made inside a microservice, such as the order uh, processing microservice or whatever it is, or inside a module. And it should not be exposed because the persistence is something that should be encapsulated. And I think this is basically one of the misunderstandings. It's not event sourcing is not so much about the communication and the events that we use for communication, but it's rather about uh, the events that are local to a module or a microservice. Yes, I completely agree. And this, this is why I, I really like your original point, right? It's saying that, yes, event sourcing is a pattern that you might find interesting for maybe some services that you have for whatever reason. Right. But then that's a that's a pattern how you implement that service, right? It's an internal pattern of how you do that, and it's not something that you apply to your whole organization. That that was my understanding a little bit of what you said, and I I exactly. wholeheartedly agree with that. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I I do remember that you also said you know some of the things where you say okay, and this is actually then how you can use Kafka. Kind of in a better way or not like walking into that trap so what would be your your recommendations what to look out for or what to focus on so that you don't kind of use that pattern that you find problematic yeah first of all as i said i think it's not about uh, kafka in particular it's about messaging yeah. systems and it's it's in particular a problem with kafka because kafka has this great feature that you can store events basically forever so so it wouldn't be possible probably to to implement it with any other messaging system to me it boils down to modules 
and persistence should be local in a module. It should be encapsulated uh, and that also applies to microservices. So that is one thing and that is why event sourcing should be a local decision to one microservice or one module. And uh, the other thing is um, if we want to have decoupling, um, there is a trade-off between dependencies and reuse. You made the point about how APIs should be reused. And that's, of course, a sound goal for APIs. But on the other hand, that also means uh, that you will have a lot of dependencies because if a lot of people use it and it's really frequently reused, it means there will be a lot of people, teams, components that depend on it. So there is a trade-off. And I have the impression that in particular with these messaging systems and these event-based systems, um, the, this trade-off is often decided in favor of reuse and it is forgotten that there is even a trade-off between reuse and uh, coupling and dependencies. And that is just something that, you know, I want to bring back in the minds of the, the people to make that trade-off and to be ide ideally be explicit about the trade-off. And if you end up with, uh, you know, that one data structure that everyone depends on, it might be a sound decision and I'm fine with that. I like the way you just put that. So my understanding was what you said is that because these messaging systems such as Kafka in many cases are these centralized components, right? There's this one messaging hub that you use that does all the wonderful things for you. You kind of get pulled in the direction a little bit of saying like one message format basically for one thing to rule them all. Like that's that's your kind of natural tendency to do because your all the messages are kind of going into the same place anyway. Right. So th that's a, a good point. Uh, because, so the infrastructure is there, it's centralized. So it sort of lures you into a way where, where also the data structure should be centralized. There is a different thing that I experienced at one point where there were, we discussed an architecture like the one that we just uh, discussed here as well. And I asked the question, so um, how do you decide what is part of the event? Because I wanted to figure out uh, which parts of the events are provided for which services and how this whole thing works in the organization. As I said, the delivery address would be interesting for delivery, the invoicing address would be interest, uh, interested, interesting for invoicing and so on and so on. So there should be some process that decides that, I thought. But uh, the, the response was, uh, we just sent out all the information that we have about the order. And I found that interesting because it basically means um, that there is no such process in place or people don't even think about it. And that is why I think this, this, this point is very important. I think if you have a data structure, if you have an interface, if you have an API, it is actually tied to communication because someone has some requirements for it. And even that's, and you know, it causes dependencies between teams also on the software level. And this whole thing doesn't seem to be entirely clear to, to everyone. So that's, that's one of the points. Yeah. Yeah, there always is like, I think, you know, we, we talked about this briefly already. There's always kind of the straight off of trying to achieve complete reusability without um, having, you know, it's like these explicit dependencies, but you always like whoever uses it needs to find it useful. Exactly. And you need to talk about that. So you do have a dependency at one point. Yeah, it's somehow. No, possible. absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Eva, thanks so much for joining. I, I really find these discussions fascinating. And I really think I, I would like to talk more to you about, you know, this, this tension or like I said, trade off between reuse uh, and, and whether you reuse is always good or bad for this, because I think that's really an interesting discussion to have. But uh, thanks so much for joining today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope everybody else enjoyed it and um, talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. I enjoyed it a lot and I'm happy to be back uh, for more discussions. Okay, see you soon then. Bye everybody. Bye.